This year is the sesquicentennial observance of the American Civil War. Although Ames was founded late in the Civil War years, December of 1864, our town's development was heavily influenced by Civil War veterans who were seeking new lives in the West after the war ended. Tonight, we salute Iowa's history of brave fighting soldiers, especially those who fought in the Civil War. Our presenter, O.J. Fargo, is retired from the Green Valley Area Education Agency in Creston, where he was a social studies consultant and director of support services. OJ is also the president of the Army of the Southwest, a group of Civil War reenactors headquartered in Adel. He contributes to several Iowa history websites and maintains one on Iowa in the Civil War aimed at students and teachers. Mr. Fargo is the author of three books and 25 booklets on the Civil War, Iowa, and Western history. And I think I saw those booklets out in front. Okay. He is currently working on a book about Iowa's participation in the Civil War and is producing four CDs containing 320,000 pages of searchable text and 10,000 pictures. That's a job. <laughs> Mr. Fargo has brought along a full roster of all, all men who served in and from Iowa in the Civil War. If anyone would like to check for ancestors who served. And now, Mr. Fargo. Well, I wasn't sure how the, the rain and all the, the terrible stuff, I got reports from these guys, oh my God, it's going to rain, we're all going to die. It all sounded like my life, but we braved it all, so hopefully we'll all make it home okay, too. Uh, if anybody is interested uh, in, in seeing more of the Civil War type stuff, uh, our unit, which is called the Army of the Southwest, does go to a number of locations around Central Iowa. We're going to be in Polo this year, we're going to be in Carlisle, uh, Waukee, a variety of other places. So if you're interested in anything like that, I think that's what you were asking. Uh, if you go onto the internet, either type in Iowa Reenactor or Iowa Civil War or Army of the Southwest. That's the name of our outfit. There's about 45 to 50 of us. Everything from soup to nuts. We've got everything from Invalid Corps, which is something that nobody else does as far as I know in the country. Uh, cavalry, artillery, infantry, uh, sanitary commission. If it happens sometime during the Civil War, there's always an opportunity to be able to present that. Okay. And she mentioned too, there's a display out front uh, with a variety of Civil War things. And with a crowd this size, I'm going to have to kind of spread myself a little thin. But if somebody is interested in checking their Civil War ancestors, now this is just in Iowa. I have a lot of information on these guys that normally you wouldn't find. So I mainly put that together, it took a long time, uh, for high school kids and elementary kids who see history as something that always happened to somebody else, someplace else, and why would we really care? Well, when they start to see Story County, when they start to see their last name in Story County, now they start to get interested about the whole thing. So that's our unit's main vision, which is education. Yeah, we shoot each other, we do all sorts of other things, but only to try to lure people in so we can get them to be a bit more interested in history. The book she was talking about, they're out on the counter out there, and Cedric is going to be out there after the, the presentation. The bound books, the one with spiral bindings, are 10 dollars. If I bring them, nobody wants them. If I don't bring them, then everybody wants them, so I don't know how this is going to work. Uh, so if you're interested in that, most of the time, all I see is some money laying on the table, so I'm assuming somebody bought a book. If you're interested in that, fine. If you're interested in any of the rest of the paraphernalia that's out there, uh, I've got millions all over the place. Sometimes that's good. Uh, there's six people from my Civil War outfit here, 
all of which are probably equally, or if not more knowledgeable about the topic than I am. So it's kind of a spooky thing. Uh, these two guys here, you want to stand up? If you got any questions, would you guys stand up? Seth, would you stand up too? Because of the crowd this size, if you've got any kind of questions, and there's a line that starts to form after me afterwards, go find one of these guys. They can answer about the same kind of questions that I do. Okay? Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, the way I'm going to do this tonight is I'm going to become a returning veteran from the Civil War. My name is Thomas M. Goodfellow. I would have enlisted in 1861 in August. I would have re-enlisted in 1864. I would have come home just about that same time in August again in 1865. Tonight, I'm going to be on my way back from the war after having spent basically about four years out there. I'm just on my way back to Afton, Iowa, and it just so happens this is where the stage line took me. So I just happened in here for a drink of water, and by God, who isn't there? The same rummies I've seen half my life. And all of you people, all of which are staring at me. So once I go into first person, it's going to be 1865. And I don't mind questions throughout the, throughout the presentation, because it's not a canned presentation. I'm going to go where you are going to take me, is what it amounts to. I am going to talk about what they did, what they ate, that sort of thing. And then I'll go from there until they call time on me. So at any point in time you want to ask a question, just raise your hand or make a noise or something, get my attention, and we'll go from there. But I'm only going to be able to answer from 1865 context. So every once in a while, somebody will miss that point. They'll say, well, I had an ancestor in the Civil War. Really? What well, ancestor might that have been? And what Civil War are you talking about? It gets kind of messy. So keep in mind, it'll be 1865. All right. Any questions before I get going? Were you married? Was I married? Yes. OK, I'll go right into it. <laughs> yes. Uh, when I left, I was married. When I got back, I wasn't. Uh, it's one of those Dear Thomas letters, I think. When I was down in Georgia, she decided there was other things going on up here, so that's pretty much the last time I saw her. Yes, How was I? I'll get into that in just a second. Uh, the, well, I'll take you through that whole thing, okay? And then if I miss something, you holler at me. I'm going to first tell you how I got into it in the first place. Yes, sir. How long did you leave in the Civil War? I was there for about four years. In fact, almost exactly four years. About a month or two shy. I think I said I went in in August. Actually, I went in July of 61. And then I finished in, I came back in August of 65. They let us go in Louisville, Kentucky, and we had to make our own way back here. So I hopped aboard a steamboat, took that as far as Keokuk, and then actually I went up the river because I couldn't find any transportation from Keokuk on home. So I went up to Davenport, took the railroad over there, and then basically either walked or took the stagecoach or took the ride with somebody between now and then. I think a returning veteran with the war being over, a lot of people were, were real prone to do whatever they could, you know, feed you. So yeah, I was fairly popular at the end. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Were you close to Washington, D.C. when Lincoln was shot? Did I what? Were you close to Washington, D.C. when Lincoln was shot? I was in uh, North Carolina when Lincoln was shot. Uh, and yeah, personally believed it, because you know, for the most part of the war was over. Lee had surrendered just you know, a few days before that. So we couldn't believe who would want to shoot Lincoln. It made us mad, really mad. Because we were still fighting. We were down by Bentonville, North Carolina, still fighting with uh, Johnson down there. Well, he quit just shortly thereafter. But yeah, it's, you just have to be stupid to do stuff like that. You know, they shot themselves in the foot when they did that. That's for guys, for not sure. Yeah, and then, then after we got done, we made sure they all went home. They weren't causing any trouble or anything. And we got to do, they do that big parade through Washington, D.C. afterward. Because they were still afraid that there were going to be people 
some of the southern leaders wanted to continue on like guerrillas. And some of the boys I'm sure would have, but bless Robert E. Lee's heart, and I didn't think I'd ever say that. Uh, he, he said, no, boys, you go home, it's over. So a lot of them had locked over heads, otherwise should we still be down there chasing each other? That would have been real mess, real mess. So yeah, we got to put two days for all these units to march through. That was a big celebration at the end. That was all right. I can't believe some of those people were cheering that long. But I think they came to me. You can't fool me. Okay. Any other? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I could have transferred if I wanted to, but I saw no need to. We started off in the 4th Iowa, and the 4th Iowa came, or at least one of the companies, came from Athens and in through there, so I knew most of those guys. So why go with another unit that I didn't know anybody? Plus, we had a really good reputation. We had really good leaders throughout that. They didn't lead us into any real stupid situations or get us killed and that sort of thing. Some of them couldn't say that. But our leaders were real capable, so I saw no reason to switch. I could have switched if I wanted to. No need. Okay. When the war starts, now I'll get to kind of where you wanted to go. All right, I was trading off being a shopkeeper and teaching school down in Athens. And I had originally come from Davenport. And I had taken my hand in working in shops over there and that sort of thing. And my father had done that. But we wanted to go west. And they had just opened up down there by Athens. Yeah, 1852 was the first year that that land was open. So we thought, oh boy, you know, we'll go and we'll be the, the ringleaders on all this stuff. Well, it didn't quite work out. I was not a farmer, and even if I would have been, I wasn't very good at it. So throughout, oh, probably 20, 30 years, north and the south have been at each other. You know, you'd read about in newspapers, and periodically somebody would tell you about it. Or There was a lot of people in Iowa that came from the south originally. Because I had only been a state since 1846. So there was a lot of people I knew came from Georgia and Virginia and places like that. Of course, they had a little bit different slam on that. But those two parts of the country have been going at each other. They're back since Washington's time. They were back in the 1700s. Well, we just didn't pay any attention to them after a while, because every time they didn't get their way down there, hey, I'm going to leave. I'm going to take my, you know, this, that, the other thing and go home. Well, after a while, nobody really believed it. They tried that with Andrew Johnson when he was around. He said, you do that, I'm going to come down and spank your little rear end. And that pretty much put an end to that. So when they finally all said they were going to secede, when Lincoln was elected, well, most of us just thought that was an excuse and they were going to go hang their lip for a while and not come back. So nobody thought a whole lot about it. Iowa wasn't prepared at all. A lot of those states, they had some militia. Well, Iowa didn't have much. There was one in, oh, not too far from us, so we did not take one. Yeah, but they only got together. They said look good for the girls. They had fancy uniforms, and they'd march up and down, and then they'd always go someplace and have a dance and either find some nice-looking young lady or I'll take a couple of pops off that thing that, you know, that you guys take a pop off all the brown bottle, yeah. They will be joyful, you know how that works. Uh, so, yeah, they drill and they do all sorts of things, but nobody thought that was really going to happen. And even after some of those southern states started to secede, nobody really believed it, and everybody said, oh, we got to compromise, because we've been doing that for 40 years. It was the Missouri Compromise, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the 1850s, you know, just all sorts of stuff. Well, I don't know what happened. I think people just got tired of compromising, and all the compromisers died off. But first thing you know, they're shooting at Fort Sumter. Well, that just kind of irritated everybody I knew. How dare they do that stuff? They're going to break off from the Union. We just you know, hadn't been around them that long. So a lot of people got really upset. Plus, nobody thought that war was going to last anymore in about three months. So there was some 
Gay go down in Charleston. He said, I'll personally sop up all the blood spilled in that thing with my handkerchief. Well, we come about halfway believe that. We believed we were going to go down to Missouri in a very big bunch of us. Go down there and be mean to them for a while, and they were going to say, Oops, sorry, we made a mistake. And we were going to come back home and be big heroes. Well, they thought the same thing. In fact, their textbooks throughout that time had story problems in them, like, you know, if one, one uh, Confederate can take care of six, or if one Confederate can take care of six Yankees, how many Yankees can nine Confederates take care of? Well, that's the kind of stuff that they were putting out. So, there was a big mad rush to enlist. Well, I was going nowhere. You know, I had a part-time job teaching school, and I was standing by the counter, and I thought, well, hey, this is kind of exciting. Three months, they're going to give me a spiffy outfit. Why'd you guys enlist? Girl, all right, yeah, okay. there's always that. How many of you uh, ladies like being in uniform? <laughs> Not, no, no, no. Yeah, no hands go up, right. Okay, well, he's absolutely correct. That's one of the reasons. You guys said, why did you guys enlist? The so what? Ah, I got good food. We'll talk about food after a while, but you got it for free, right? And pretty much as much as you want to eat, right? Yeah, well, when they see you out there, they'll know how that works. You got a regular paycheck. All right, sure. Because you weren't making any money before that war started. I know I wasn't. You know, teaching school isn't exactly the most lucrative profession. And they're going to get 13 bucks a month to start off with. And it's going to play good with the girls. They're going to feed us. They're going to get us uniform. Okay, so you chose. You were already there. Well, you bet. Alright, this man is a major. So majors make about 13 times more than I do, and they have two servants. So I can see why he has was interested in the whole thing. And a horse. And a horse. I forgot about the horse. Absolutely. Alright. Did you enlist for some reason other than what one of these guys did? Or she kicked you out of the house? <laughs> All right, there is that too, you know. Hey, you know, we're going to go down to Missouri, and it's nice down there, and we're going to come back, and it's going to be a big hero, and we're going to be a big hero. And I don't doubt you pushed it, did you? Some? Absolutely. A lot of pressure to go. A lot of pressure to go. You know, what's wrong with you? Why won't you go do this? All right. All those things combined. But most of the people I knew, they were upset. Not upset, they were irritated, beyond irritated. But I didn't like pumping, so let's call it irritation right now. About them shattering the union. It hurt their feelings. It hurt a lot of our feelings. So when the governor, they fired on Fort Sumter. And our governor, uh, Governor Kirkwood, he was friends with Lincoln. So Lincoln said, you're out here in the middle of nowhere. Iowa, there was nothing beyond Iowa. Okay. So he said, look, we want one regiment. A regiment is a thousand men. And one regiment is composed of ten companies of a hundred men each. He said, we want a thousand men from Iowa. Fifteen thousand guys show up in the recruiting office. Okay. Which wasn't us. None of us made the first cut, did we? Yeah. Yeah. At least I didn't see any of you guys. But you would enlist with your friends. So it wasn't uncommon. The way that would normally go, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, is remember how long is the war going to last? Three months. Three months. Three months. Three three months. months. Yeah, okay. Three months. So if you don't get in on the first thing, you're just tough out of luck. Because the last war was in 1846. So it had been 25 years. Well, if we miss this one, who knows, you know. We're not going to be around for the next one, and then, you know, the grandkids are going to say, what did you do during the big war, Grandpa? And you go, uh, I taught school in Athens. Okay. It didn't make a very good story. Plus, they're going to feed me, they're going to give me the girls. Well, the girls are going to come along if they feed me, I guess. And spiffy uniforms, and I get to serve under sterling individuals like this over here. Oh, uh, yeah, I might be proud to do that. Okay. Uh, so, the first
first rush is over, first bull run comes around, Lincoln wants 100,000 volunteers, he gets them. They start to fight. Both sides pretty quick figure out the other side ain't giving up. All this propaganda about how the other side's a bunch of sissies and they won't fight, they won't do this, and they won't do that, all of a sudden the little light bulb goes on. This is going to be a real, especially when those casualty lists start coming back. All of a sudden, now they get far more interested in taking guys like us. So in Iowa, they enlist the 2nd Infantry, the 3rd Infantry, the 4th Infantry. It took them a while to get around to the cavalry because they didn't think the war was going to last long enough to train them. Because most people figure country boys are all good horsemen. They're not. Okay? A lot of them have never been bareback. Because if you're working on a farm, there isn't much call for you hopping on a horse and going someplace. You need something behind you to carry things. This, the, the boys down south, they had good cavalry. Okay, they were horsemen, they were equestrians. Uh, so it takes a while. So pretty soon that war just keeps going and going and going. But the way it happened to me, we were in Afton. And all of a sudden they figure out they need more people. So they can have a rally. So the mayor shows up and they have a brass band and there was a, a veteran from the Mexican-American War and speeches all over the place. Well, we all knew what we were going to do ahead of time. There was 20, 30 of us and we said, well, I'm going to go ahead and get So we knew what was going to happen. We were just waiting for them to finish up. Finally, after all this hoopla, and they said, who will enlist? And of course, we all run to the front. In fact, I think I saw you running to the front too, didn't I? That happened a lot. You know, women said, let me know. And no, 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 not going to happen. Uh, but they were some of the biggest patriots. So we all go up and we sign the roster. They gave us two weeks to get all our, our affairs in order. So that was the enlistment. They said, okay, now you're going to muster. So in two weeks, you come back and meet you right here in the town square. And after. So we did. When we all got there, we elected our officers. So we already knew who the, the colonel was going to be, and he was Colonel Dodge. <coughs> and the governor appointed him. All the real hot shots, the lieutenant colonel, the major. So you got your appointment. Were you a political appointee, or you said you came through? <coughs> all right. Uh, even though you went to, went to West Point? I guess, I guess going to West Point and graduating from West Point is two little different things. Huh? <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, uh, so yeah, major and above would have been appointed by the governor. So there was reason. And in a lot of cases, these guys would outfit a company, or they would outfit the whole regiment. Well, guess who's going to get to be the hot shot in that After that, from uh, company grade on up, captain, lieutenants, uh, we got to elect those. So we all got together in a group and we voted as to who was going to get to be the captain. And we thought, wow, ah, nice guy, you know, he'll be okay. All right? And then from captain on down, the lieutenants, they got together and that's how Monty got to be a sergeant. Yeah, he must have pictures of him or something, or some of those French pictures. All right. They did the captain, or the captain and the lieutenants then appointed the sergeants and the corporals and that sort of thing. Sometimes that stuck, sometimes that did stuck. Okay? Just because Major Ruby might have been a nice guy and the, the governor liked it, didn't mean after a while they didn't kind of look at it pretty carefully and go, wait a minute, maybe we made a mistake here. So it wasn't uncommon for these guys to either resign. Because at any point in time during the war, he could resign, we're stuck. Once we enlisted, we're enlisted. So, at that point, we've got our officers elected, and but they don't know any more about things than we do. When the war starts, there's only 15,000 guys in the army. Within the first month, all of a sudden, you've got 100,000. You know what that means? What? Inexperience. Inexperience. That means there's 15,000 guys who know what they're doing and 285,000 who don't have a clue. All right? This is the way both sides go off the war. All right? uh, when
when we got drilled by our sergeants or our captains, they're looking in these French books on tactics on how to do this stuff. So they're learning how to do it about three hours before they show, show us how. And it wasn't uncommon, because I remember some of these guys. They're farm boys. Everything is north, east, south, and west, right? You don't tell somebody to take the left road. You tell them to take the west road out of town. All right? So when they get out there and they're trying to drill, because they don't understand it, they seem, first of all, they've never seen 100 guys all in one place, let alone all wearing the same kind of clothes. So they're kind of all struck about this. Well, at first, the sergeants you know, are up there going, OK, left face. Well, after they lose their voice after about a half hour, they finally figure out that they're going to have to do what they're told to do. So they appoint drummers, and they appoint buglers. So these guys got to learn 27 different bugle calls, because you can't holler at a group like this out in the middle of a field and expect to get them to do anything. So everything was done by bugle or drum. So the bugles have, buglers have to learn it, they have to learn it, and all of you guys have to learn it. Okay? And if you miss it, somebody is going to show you what you should have missed. Now, I remember this guy here. We get him out to drill. And he doesn't know his left from his right. But he's a barn boy. And he also knows something about horses. So he does know all about hay and straw. So what we do with him is we stick a sprig of str uh, straw in one foot, in one boot, and a sprig of hay in another boot, and that's how we drill. Hay foot, straw foot, hay foot. It only took him about a month or so to figure out that the left was hay. And, unless he switched boots, and then we were all in deep trouble. Right? So it kind of looked like a drunken centipede for the most part. But it all worked out so far for these guys the way they wanted it to work out. Because ringed around this square, are all those honeys that you like so well. Oh, Larry, what a guy. OK, except we also have no uniforms. Uh, nobody is ready for the war. So now uh, you go in and say, OK, so what am I going to wear? So you show up whatever you bring from home. So I know one of the companies out of Winterset, they showed up with baggy red pants and uh, blue vests two of them, with big gold piping all over the place, and a fez for a hat, because they thought, like so, the hottest group in the world, was a French group that fought in Algeria called the Zouaves. So they all show up looking like somebody's Christmas tree. <laughs> they had nothing else, so why not? The first regiment out of Iowa, the first out, they dressed them in gray. Because the governor has no clothes, he has no uniforms, he has no weapons, he has no nothing. So he sends one of his emissaries to Chicago. Well, the only thing a guy can find that has a, enough volume is the ladies in Keokuk said that they would, would sew all this stuff for him. So he comes back with something called pink satinette. When I first looked at that, you know, you read the after courier and you're dressed in pink satinette. <laughs> Well, pink satin, that's kind of gray, it's that kind of pink tinge to it, all right? But they dress them to look pretty. So by the time these guys are down in Missouri for a month and a half, because they only enlisted them for three months, because that's all the war, they didn't want to pay. If the war's going to be over, why would they want to have them hang around? Most of these guys didn't even plant when they left in, in April, because they figured they'd be back by, you know, planting time, it's not a problem. So they were not the seat of their pants by the time they get a month down in Missouri. So these guys were all running around looking like Indians because they got flower stacks hanging up the rear end. When it comes to us in the fourth time, somebody comes up with black wool. So they dress us in black wool. Now we did look pretty, I'll grant you that. But whoever sends somebody down to Missouri in August, dressed in two layers of black wool, should be shot. It was probably your fault. I know it wasn't my idea. So nothing, none of these uniforms look the same on either side until about a year into the war, because they're not prepared. So they have to take whatever they can get. There also is no weaponry. So we're drilling with uh, wooden, whatever we've got, either shotguns we bring from home, 
or wooden rifles that we whittle out of something. And so we're hay footing and straw footing and pretending like we're shooting something. Uh, we did have a few weapons because they were left over from uh, the old John Brown days. We did have a, an arsenal in the state, they tell me. But the guns we had, we, we figured they could shoot around corners because the barrels were brent. Some of them we called mule kickers, 72 caliber job. So if you pulled the trigger on one of these, it just felt like a mule kicked you in the shoulder. And that's the kind of stuff we were using. Of course, no power, no nothing. For the most part, whatever, in those, those early four or five months, whatever Pennsylvania didn't want, Ohio got. Whatever Ohio didn't want, Indiana got. Whatever Indiana didn't want, Illinois got. Whatever's left over, we got. So we just did the best we could with what we had. There were some of the outfits, the third island, right ahead of us. They didn't get arms until they were ready to go into battle the day of. So that was the first time these guys have ever had their own rifle. So it's amazing that we did it as well, looking back. Oh, we were proud. We were proud. I mean, everybody was out there. The women were bringing us chicken. Mom was dressing us up like we were just, you know. Then all of a sudden, we learned how to drill. And we learned how to make maneuvers. And we all thought that was a waste of time. Just let us go down, pick somebody's tiny, we'll come back and everything will be okay. That's what we thought was going to happen. These guys are going to be all, all, all. Okay. So we learned how to do that. We learned how to make quarters, we learned our drum beats, and we lived in tents, and we just think it's kind of quite the deal. And just before we leave, because they take us to a camp over in Council Bluffs, Camp Kirkwood, and that's where we're going to meet up with the rest of our regiment, the other 900 guys the other nine companies. And now we're going to learn how to do things as a group. So they march us over, and if we had baggage trains that stretched until the cows couldn't come home. Because before we leave after, Mama makes sure we've got two blankets, and you know, Grandpa brings us one of those big old horse pistols. Somebody else brings us a buoy knife. And all they want to make sure we're just, you know, we're just taken care of. Well, most of that stuff lasted for about 10 miles. Because now we kind of look like, I don't know, traveling in circuses or something. But it looks pretty good in camp. Now try carrying it for 20 miles to see what happens. Okay, and then once again, that was in August. So we did have, back then, we had wagon trains. So we had a train that quite literally stretched for a mile and a half. Just for these three or four companies we'd be picking up. We had sinks, and we had stoves, and we had cooking utensils, you name it. It wasn't very long before we had nothing. Just all gone. Looked like a rubbish sale driving down the road. Okay. Out there, we learned how to deal with the other thousand guys. From there, they take us on a steamboat, and we end up in Jefferson Barracks down in Missouri. There, we learned how to deal with uh, brigades. So now there's 3,000 of us learning how to do that. And they try to explain to us, once you get out of the field, you aren't going to be able to see anything, you aren't going to be able to do anything. When you hear that bugle go, tick, 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 first thing you look for is that flag, and you gather around it as best you can. That's what you learn. Okay? And when we want you to go a different direction, You'll hear that drum, and you're all going to get in some sort of a line, and you're going to now make a left turn together, and you're all going to go down what well, we all thought that was the dumbest thing we ever heard in our lives. Right, boys? Just give us a gun and let us go down and light somebody up down there. <laughs> but we did it anyway. I remember I saw a letter from one of the guys his mom about the afternoon that he did that day. And he writes her back and said, well, we got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and we all signed our names on the roll call, and we drilled, we drilled, we drilled, we drilled. And then we went on to the team duty. We cleaned the place up, some was dug dishes, and some was buried the mules that died that night. And then we drilled, we drilled, we drilled, we drilled, and we ate lunch. Actually dinner. And then we drilled, we drilled, we drilled, we drilled, we drilled. This went on for about four drills, and then we went to bed. And that's about the way it works. Okay? Now, our artillery guys, I don't know what you guys did all day long. Room horses, or look, looked in the mirror and tried to make sure you looked pretty, or? Okay, all right. I don't know, they, we're just grunts. 
Between man, I guess I should be talking to Cedric. <laughs> Cavalry just got it made, artillery guys are right behind now, so you know how that goes. Right? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, then we finally get close. And after about 1862, they dress us like they are like we are now. Before then, you couldn't tell who you were fighting. Because like the first Iowa gets down and they, the one and only battle they fought was down in Springfield, Missouri, Wilson's Creek. And they ended up taking the worst of it because the commander was on top of the hill like they always are. And all of a sudden, his second command, he says, look, there's Confederates coming up that side of that hill. He says, no, that isn't Confederates who are dressed in gray. That's the first Iowa. Well, it was the second Louisiana. And that's the day he got killed. Okay. Throughout the whole war, half the time, the guys who were fighting looked like you did. Because they didn't have a whole lot of clothes. So they'd pick up the stuff that it, they'd commandeered one way or another. Either they'd capture it or somebody threw it off or whatever. So you never knew who really was on the other side. And they didn't mean to be sneaky. They just were. Okay. So what we've got here, when they finally give us our certificate out of this, the one that, which one of you guys have listened to? The, you, okay. Now you can tell, yeah, he took, he took the spiffy outfit thing serious. Uh, they did give us initially just pretty much what you see with Monty having on. They gave us long dress coats. And we had epaulets, and then we had a, what's uh, called blouse, which is what I've got on here. Okay, because we all know, you know, if you were a, a decent gentleman, you wouldn't go out without a vest or without a blouse like this, right? I see you're all prop blouse, except you. I don't know why you're in the <laughs> So they dressed us in that. They gave us two shirts, and they gave us two sets of drawers. Okay, you all know what drawers are? Okay, you do. I saw you smile. Weren't you the one that said you didn't like men in uniform or didn't weren't affected by it? <laughs> oh, you didn't say anything. Okay. All right. Two sets of drawers, two pairs of socks. That's what you march off with. And they give you one of these spiffy hats. Now this was a French design, and there was a kepi which had a low bill like this. And then this is what's called a forage hat. Now, nobody has any idea except the French hat and somebody thought it looked cute. But it serves no function whatsoever. We all had our pictures taken with the song. You see the pictures, you know, the guys, and they've got the two pistols and the saber. Have you all seen those pictures? Yeah. Well, no, fancier than that, yeah. They're sitting in a chair someplace and they're looking like this. Well, I'm sure somebody did look like that, but nobody in the right mind. Those are the pictures we had to send home. Those weren't our pistols, those weren't our sabers, those weren't our fancy outfits. That's whatever the nice man gave us. Because the garretypes, when we're just first starting to come in, the first thing Mama says is, oh, send me your picture because I want to show Aunt Tilly. You know, one of those. All right, so we had our picture taken. You tell your well, what's Mama want to see? She wants to see a brave, stalwart type fellow, so I'll give her one. I'm not going to let her see me look like this. Because, Remember I said they gave you one jacket, two pair of underwear, two shirts. That's what you had, period. Period. Okay? And if you were going to try to wash someplace, it would have been in the same place that you were uh, also drinking out. Plus, by the time you take this blouse off, and then you go on a little 20-mile jaunt, this is all made out of wool, you kind of look and smell like a wet dog for the next four or five hours. So there wasn't any great incentive to go out and wash your clothes. First of all, we all spent lives so and nobody cared. Uh, secondly, it wasn't too very long before we got out there and we found out we had some very close companions that stayed with us for a good part of the war. And those were called graybacks. Does anybody know what grayback is? Yeah. Lice. Lice. Very good. Everybody had them. Generals had them. Privates had them. Everybody had them. We raced them for a while because it was kind of boring in camp. You'd put two of them on like a tin plate, and then you'd bet as to whose lice was going to lice was going to get to the outside first. The only way to get rid of them wasn't to wash them. Those little suckers would hang on. You'd have to boil. Well, 
we'll get into food here after a bit. But keep in mind, you're running around with at least a thousand of your best friends. And you've got two boilers. So you're going to have to stand in line for a long time. So the only way to get rid of those gray dots would be to toast them. So at night, what you do sometimes is just take your jacket, first to turn your jacket inside out. It may not get rid of them, but it took them a while to figure it out and get back to where they wanted to be again. Take a day's march is what we used to say to get back. And then you touch them. So you can hear them kind of go, <laughs> You've never been there. <laughs> this is just kind of normal stuff. You want to get into really gross stuff? I'll get into that in a At any rate. Uh, so, we've now got our spiffy outfits. These make no sense whatsoever because there is no air can get in there. So if you're out marching, especially if you're out marching someplace where it's hot, you've got no air circulation, you've got no protection for your ears, very little for your, for your face. So the first thing we do is take these after we get our pictures taken, get rid of those, and we get into something that actually makes some sort of sense. So if you see a lot of the pictures that it took of us when we first leave, we look pretty good. If you see them after that, it looks like we've been sleeping in these clothes for a month or two. Do you know why that is? Because we've been sleeping in those month clothes for a month or two. All right. You'd, get, you'd send home and you'd say, all right, look, Mama, send me something like this. Because we used to have guys that would be in our camps called suckers, and they would sell you these things. Well, when you're making $13 a month and they want $14 for this pack, it just doesn't work real well. But we used to get a lot of packages from home. Now you've got to have to make some sort of sense because this is now felt that will breathe. You can use it like this if it's raining out. Otherwise, you've got a hat like that other one. Your brains runs right down the back of your neck. This thing here, at least, it'll run down your back as opposed to the back of your neck. It's warmer. It sheds better. You've got shade all the way around. Because if you're down, like when we were down in southern Missouri, we're in a whole lot of people there to be our welcome committees. So if you came down with blisters, sunstroke, something like that, they didn't stop. These 10,000 guys, you were on your own. Hopefully you can get a ride in the wagon or something like that. Maybe yes, maybe no. But you didn't get left behind, that's for sure, one way or another. So we start to do things that make a lot more sense. We throw away the six extra blankets. We get rid of the pistol, we get rid of the knife, we get rid of everything. The two frying pans we took when we started off, as you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta eat. Well, we learned how to use cups like this. So this became basically our frying pan. We would take turns, for instance, having a little, so somebody would like carry it in their belt. Because on our back, we've got a knapsack. And everything that we needed for that evening or at any point in time was in that knapsack. Anything we needed quickly, like if they call the 10 minute halt to the march, we start digging around in here. And that's where we're going to find our salt pork, and that's where we're going to find our coffee, and that's where we're going to find the kindling to start the wood. Anything we needed right off the bat was going to be in here. Everything else, about 25 pounds worth, was going to be hanging on our back back here. Then we're also carrying a 12 pound rifle which looks a lot like that. So all together you're hauling around about 45 pounds. So life starts to become, how do we get rid of as much of this stuff as possible? Now I'm, it took me a while. I didn't think I was going to survive the experience. Being cold is one thing, being wet is one thing, being cold and wet was never ever my idea of a good time. So with wool, if it's raining and you're in it, you're wet. No well, two ways around. Uh, so we got the blouse. Underneath the blouse, that doesn't work all that well. Underneath the blouse, I have a muslin shirt with the government issue. At first, they had a lot of flannel and that sort of thing. Oh, it just doesn't work. So you switch it for cotton the first chance you get. And you know, if not, if I was on the march someplace or in a, in a camp, I might be able to trade one of the Johnnies for something like that. Uh, wool blouse, 
And I got a pair of uh, drawers on underneath, long underwear, and they're my constant companion 24-7 until basically either I can get the other pair, this one washed and the other pair on, because it doesn't make any sense to do it any other way. Because by the time you switch pairs, your first one's going to look like your second one before very long anyway, so why bother? Uh, the shoes look like this. And those of you back in the cheap seats can't see that. There used to be a time I could put my foot straight up, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, you notice they've got uh, what look like mule shoes back there. Does anybody know why I have a mule shoe in the back of my foot? Yes, very good. Your mother made you wear those, didn't she? Okay. Those of you who were around when I was around, yeah, your mother's made Because otherwise, you just couldn't get another pair. If you lost something or threw something away, like if you threw a coat away because it was summertime and you needed another one, you're going to have to buy one. We got a $40 a year clothing allowance, but that didn't go very far. And okay? like if you throw away an overcoat, now you find yourself down in Tennessee, as an example, with a foot of snow. You just probably aren't going to be able to afford a $15, $16 overcoat to take care of the one you threw away. So you learn how to make it. Uh, underneath those shoes, they might be like exactly what you said. There's no traction to them. They're slippery. But those heels don't run over. Last thing I want to be is in some place like Mississippi or Georgia walking around on my knees just feeling like they're about ready to fall off because those heels have run off. I've got two pair of socks on, two pair of wool socks. The wool is going to absorb a lot of that sweat, and if I know I'm going to go on a march that day, I'm going to soak down the, the layer that's closest to me. Because if something's going to rub on something, I want it to be rubbing on each other and not on my feet. Because if I get blisters, I'm just stuck with them. So the two pair of socks aren't for comfort or aren't for warm, they're to make sure that I don't get blisters. The shoes themselves are broken. And like when I was back home, if I needed a pair of shoes, I needed to talk to my dad, or I'd go to the cobbler, and they'd measure my feet, and I'd have shoes that actually fit. When they gave us all these clothes, it was whatever they were making that day. So nothing ever fit. If the, the boys in Fort Leavenworth or at uh, Shoddy Town in uh, Massachusetts are making sizes that fit three of you, then that's what you got that day when they were handing them out. So you just swapped around. So if mine's too big, I try to find somebody else who's got one that's too small. Well, it's the same way with shoes. They didn't come in sizes, they just gave you whatever they had. So what you would do is walk around in a creek for an hour or so and get those shoes good and soft and wet, just don't take long. After a while, it would mold to your feet and you would have shoes that fit a lot better. Okay? On the outside, they were rough. Like at home, sometimes we shine on us. Well, when you were in the Civil War, you didn't do that. Because they shed the, the moisture a lot easier if they had the rough side out. So if you're out running around camp in the morning on that dewy grass, you got a problem if all of a sudden your feet are wet at 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. You've got nothing to look forward to for a good long time. That's the clothing we had. The shelter that came along with it, when we first started off, they had, God, I don't know if I got, okay. The magic lantern shows just were slick, don't they? <laughs> this is pretty uptown stuff. Started off with something called a Sibley tent. It looked like that, but it could be teepee. And you would sleep 12 guys in one of those. And it had the same things like Indians would have had. You had big uh, slats, or not slats, Supports. That's what I'm trying to say. You sleep 12 people in that, and you would sleep like the spokes on a wheel. So in the summertime, you would sleep to your head to the outside. In the wintertime, you'd probably sleep to your head to the inside, because there was a fire in that middle part. Okay, so you just bank it way down in the, in the wintertime. Uh, well, it took wagons and wagons and wagons to haul this stuff around. So the next thing they do is give us a different tent. And it was called an A-frame. That's the one you see up there in the upper right-hand corner. And they were just, looked like a big egg. They were about seven foot long. And you'd sleep eight people in one of those. And you'd sleep like schools. So if one guy wanted to roll over in the night, 
they'd all have to roll over in the night. So it made for a lot of interesting situations. If you'd be in a camp or something like that, you can imagine, you know, bunking out with a couple hundred of your good buddies. Somebody would roll over, screaming and hollering and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that would go on. Well, you also had to have poles for them. You had to have a ridge pole, you have to have two in the middle. So they got tired of those pretty quick too, so they started to give us these things here called shelter paths. And you would get, some people call them dog tents, and you would get just a piece of canvas. So sometimes you would use it kind of a lean-to, sometimes you'd buddy up with one of your friends and you'd make it into a little bitty A tent. Most times you just wouldn't use it at all. The only time you'd use it, because it really didn't do you much good. If you were, oh, you know, I imagine the average guy in our regiment was about 5'6". Well, these tents are about 5'4". So part of you would be hanging out someplace or another, just all kind of good part you want. And because they buttoned together at the top, they weren't exactly uh, weather tight. There was no front and there was no back. So you're okay as long as the wind's blowing from the west, you at least got a chance. Plus, there's two of you in this thing. So, for the most part, we just find a tree or something like that and throw the tent over the top of it, not even bother to put it up. Then comes the time when they're going to feed you. Larry's favorite time. All right, well, Larry thinks he's in pretty good shape as long as he's in camp, as long as he's in Athens. He has all those women. Oh, no, you're a food guy. Yeah, women, food. Oh, they went together back then. They'd be bringing out chicken, because you were real popular back then. Chicken, salads, and oh my god, all sorts of stuff. Well, we finally get over to that big old camp over there in Council Bluffs, and now we find out what food's all about. And they said, you are the most well-fed army in this world. And we probably were, because every day we got a half a pound of either salt pork or what we call salt horse, which is beef. Sometimes it had just the prettiest shine on the outside of that. You know, you kind of make it do a little dance in the sun. Because unless you were carrying a herd with you, this stuff had been dead for a long, long time. <laughs> it had to salt that cup down. Okay? So you had two choices. Either it could look really pretty. Some of it, I remember at times giving those things just a decent burial because it had been dead and gone for a long time. You just could not eat it. Other times, some of the guys would take it because it was so heavily salted. Just throw a hook to it and let it sit in the creek. Now, that pretty much took all the taste out of the whole thing, and you don't know what was in that creek ahead of time. Water-wise, I remember one time, oh, I was filling my canteen. My sergeant said, well, what's that water taste like? Well, I said, you know, I kind of scooped the, the stuff off the top, and it didn't add. What are you going to do? And he said, well, take a little swig of that and tell me what you think. I said, yeah, you know, it's okay. Well, he points around and he does one of these. We walk about 20 foot this way around this little bend, there's a dead mule laying there in the middle of the <laughs> Well, you did what you did. All right. So I said, all right, the mule didn't look that bad. So, <laughs> that, well, yeah, yeah, that would be a good thing is to go upstream. For some reason, it didn't dawn on me that time. but. Yeah, upstream would have been a good thought. You should have come along with us. You could have been the brains of the office. <laughs> All right, in addition to either salt pork or salt horse, now if you were lucky, you'd have a herd with you, they'd slaughter right there on the spot. So you'd have fresh meat. Otherwise, it was, and sometimes we had canned meat. It all depends on where we were at. Uh, you also got either potatoes or rice or beans, depending, once again, where you were at, what they could get to you, that sort of thing. Uh, coffee. I don't know if we could live without coffee, could we, boys? And you're three rations. You, I don't know how you managed on just three rations. It's kind of tough on you, yeah, I know. Um, I don't think what else. Oh, desiccated vegetables. You remember desiccated vegetables? Okay. These things were alive at some point in time, too. We think they would have been like turnip greens or something, but they would dry them out. You never knew how to do it, but you had to put them in water, and then they would kind of come alive, sort of. I mean, if you think something hanging over the edge of your finger like this is alive, but any old port and storm is what it amounts to. Because we tried to get some of these guys, well, it's probably you, if you're too smart. We said, I'll try that. Well, the thing was, if you didn't put it in water, it'd swell up and 
lawyers come into play. Yes, ma'am. Uh, if she's asking if we helped ourselves the local guards, you wouldn't hear that from me because that was against against company orders. But only if the cavalry didn't get there first. <laughs> You, wouldn't, you really wouldn't want to have an orchard with anything hanging on the side of it as our regiment comes by, because it looked like a herd of locusts had died. But see, these guys, the cavalry was out scouting out ahead of it. So if there was a stray pig, a lot of times what they do, they'd say, okay, they try to get it to do an oath of allegiance to find out if it's a confederate pig or a union pig. Well, if it wouldn't give the oath of allegiance, they'd have to shoot. Well, okay, so by the time you got there, yeah, whatever was left, maybe. But they, they, we generally had enough rations. That generally wasn't a problem. But you, when you could buy from the settlers at some strange price, there was always somebody. Uh, locals who were willing to sell you a piece of pie or maybe even let you into the house. It all depends where we were at. Far the south we'd gone, at least in that you'd see. You'd get some of the darkies and that kind of stuff. They'd, they'd still be there. Everybody else would kind of run, you know, before you got there. Um, is that what you asked me? What did you ask me? I got you <laughs> Oh, yeah. All right, I'll be honest with you. We had a chance, yeah. But when you're with 10,000 of your closest friends, it's a mad dash to anything. All right. Well, we... Depends on how cool it was when you took it. Yeah, well, there's some truth to that, too, how cool it was when we took it and who was watching. But we did get, like I said, it was the suburbs, we got stuff from home. I mean, you know, my mom said all sorts of things that we'd share, because we all knew each other. We all were born and raised, pretty much all well, raised in, them, in the same general vicinity. So if somebody got cookies from home or something like that, we'd share it. Um, periodically, somebody did, you know, they'd, they'd put a, a bottle of, of, of whiskey inside a chicken. You weren't allowed liquor unless you could once again sneak off someplace. And the sutler sold it, but only officers could buy it from the sutlers unless you had permission. Well, generally, Major Ruby wasn't real wild about us uh, buying a couple of bottles of Obi Joyful and just having a time. But yeah, I, I remember getting bottles stuck inside chickens because they never checked. It looked like a chicken, so they let it go through. Yeah. How did it get through? How did the mail get through, she wants to know. Uh, they had a pretty good system. I really don't know how they did it. We'd give, we'd write a letter, we'd give it to the sergeant, the sergeant would give it to the quartermaster, and generally, depending where we were, say when we were in Georgia, I mean, unless we were in the, really in the middle of something, as long as we had supply lines back, they'd get it in about a week, 10 days, and same thing going in the direction. Or if the chaplain was going back and forth, You'd give him the letters and he'd just take a whole bundle because he's going back home. He'd take a whole bundle for it. So they had a pretty good system because they figured that as long as I was getting a letter from home, I knew everything was okay back home, I was pretty much okay out there. As soon as I thought, like somebody asked me, was I married? Well, that was, that was a pretty tough time. You know, my mom was there by herself. My dad was really, really sick. My wife took off. Okay, stay in Tennessee or Mississippi, go home. Yeah, okay, I know which one I'd rather do, but for a variety of reasons it didn't. Somebody up here was going to ask them? I was going to ask the same question she did about the mail. About uh, the mail? Okay. Uh, thanks, so it was 1862, uh, Postmaster was able to allow the Postmaster General was able to allow the Postmasters to carry the mail. Some of our mail. I mean, not that we 
There's nothing we could have said that they didn't publish in a newspaper first. Most of us didn't. We had a love-hate relationship with newspapers. It gave us information, but they were always got, they'd walk up to somebody like Major Ruby and say, well, where are you going? So oh, we're gonna go down and attack such and such down in uh, Renzi, Mississippi. Well, the Confederates got it about as quick as what we did. So for a long time, and I'm not fun, for a long time, they wouldn't allow reporters in the camp, one of them men here were in Europe. Finally, they kind of modified their stance. Okay, she's giving me the high sign. Uh, oh, and the last thing, food-wise, you ever heard of something called hardtack? Do you like hardtack? I'm seeing your beer back there going, oh, yeah. And I don't have, wait, maybe I do. Maybe I do. Hardtack is another one of those things that had been alive for quite a while. Yeah. If we were in camp for any length of time, if we were in camp, you were in pretty good shape, because then we'd have cooks, Otherwise, it would take, that's hard attack, okay? That's fresh hard attack. Not that there's any such thing as stale hard attack. There's hard attack that looks like this, and there's hard attack that has like weevils and that sort of stuff in it. But, that's the way it came. Uh, because you just don't have bread. So you'd have to do a number of things with it. You'd have to soak it in something or boil it in something. So it wasn't uncommon, to, like if you were in camp of an evening, just to leave it sit in coffee for two, three hours. But a lot of times we soak it in, uh, in cold water until it got mushy. And then you'd either toast it, or you'd fry it, or you'd mix it in a stew, or you'd mix it with something else and toast it with your bayonet over the, the coals. But you can't eat it like this, okay? It was one, I don't know, one of you, you guys as rookies that showed up one day, he said, how do you eat that? Well, he had it in his mouth for about an hour and a half. Because you gotta, you got to break it up. All right, well, still, nothing still was happening. So somebody said, well, stick it under your arm for a while. It'll work. <laughs> so he did. It did. Had a unique kind of a tangy kind of a taste, but it didn't did work for him. This is made of uh, just flour, water, just a pinch of salt. And they made it in Massachusetts. They were all made at one place. And they come out with great big things. If you boil it, they gave it to you about 12 of these of a day. And if the weevils got to it, that was no big deal. You couldn't shoo them off, so you just boil it. The weevils would float to the top, and you skim off the weevil. Now, the, the, the maggots were a lot harder to discharge. Okay, if they got in there, I mean, they were just stupid, because maggots don't eat dead flesh. I don't know, that doesn't even resemble dead flesh, I don't think. But if they got in there, yeah, you just kind of gave that thing a pitch. Yeah. What do you want? One, one time, one of the guys said, you know, I found something soft in one of these. It was a ten-penny nail. They thought they were just, <laughs> they thought they were just in high heaven. Okay. Let me be, see if I can do it real quick, then we'll, then I'll tell you about Iowa Civil War real quick. All right. This is a 58 caliber Enfield. When the war starts, this is the, the weapon they imported. Either side had an arsenal, and either side had any way to produce weapons. So the Brits go, oh, need weapons? Well, hello. So both sides are buying from anybody who will sell them. They buy from the Belgians, the Germans, but they pretty much standardized from the Brits because they could crank them out and produce a really good weapon. It's a 58 caliber weapon. And it fires a slug about the, like the end of your finger. It's a real slow, heavy slug. When it goes in, it just keeps on going. It doesn't bounce off anything. It just keeps on going. It sits there. All right, so it's nasty. And you loaded that, dig it in here. That's where you kept your, your cartridges. Tear off the end. That'd be one thing to keep you out of the arm if you lost your front teeth. Drop it in here. The powder goes in. The, the shell goes in, you pull that rammer, you ram it down, you put a cap on, a primer, and you're ready to go. You could do that about three times a minute if you were good. That not mean you're going to hit anything, but you could, you could do that. <laughs> if you fired that fast, this barrel would be so hot you couldn't hold it. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, now. They asked me if I would tell you all about Iowa and the Civil War, and I'm going to do the best I can in a short span of time. 
the fourth Iowa, which I represent, and I didn't look it up, Story County, there was no Ames back during the Civil War, but there was a Story County. One of the units that came through Story County was the third Iowa. And the third Iowa, almost everybody in Iowa, I don't know if you can see that back there or not. That, uh, this is St. Louis up in through there. So almost everybody from Iowa shows up there at some point in time, Jefferson Barracks, and that's where you get your training with lots of people. From there, you kind of roam around Missouri for a while. And when that war first starts, Missouri's a real hotbed. All the rest of these states down here are all Confederate. There were no Union troops down there or not. Kentucky was, when the war first starts, is, is neutral. Uh, and they want it to stay that way. So both sides keep hands off that. There's a lot of bone of contention about Missouri throughout the war. So most people from out here in the booties end up down there in Missouri. Fourth Iowa starts off up here, wins its way down, finally encounters a Confederate army right down here in Pea Ridge. That's one of the decisive battles of the Civil War that doesn't get a whole lot of play, but if it wouldn't have been for the, the, the Union, and the 4th Iowa had a hand in that, in fact, it's sort of the 9th Iowa and the, the 1st Battery. Uh, had they not stopped the Confederates down there, that Confederate Army would have taken the better part of Missouri. All the boys in the East, or you look at movies or on TV, and they're always talking about Gettysburg, Fredericksburg, places like that. What happens, let me see, young guys, are you a, are you a sports guy? Sorry. What happened? Did you play the sports at all? Okay. Well, let's pretend you did. You knew? What happens if you don't win a game in two years? What? Oh, that baseball thing you guys are always wanting to play. What happens if you don't win a game in two years? You all hot to go do it some more? Get a lot of following? Mama, are you real hot to go? No. That's what would have happened if it wouldn't have been for us hayseeds out there. See, back then they thought Iowa was populated by hayseeds at pretty much the end of the earth. Boys of New York still think that. That's not a problem. But they spend, the Army of the Potomac, the one you hear most about, they spend four years between here and here and a little bit into Virginia. During the rest of the time, all us boys from uh, Kansas, Illinois, Iowa, some from Indiana, take care of all the rest of us. But we didn't have a whole lot of newspapers, so we didn't get a lot of publicity. Okay? Scholars are just now coming around to the realization that whoops, maybe it wasn't just a bunch of yo-yos out here messing around. What they used to say is, well, they didn't have the same caliber as generals out here, and that's why you did so well. Well, we can debate that. Okay. In fact, if you remember, the guy who pulls everybody's, the unions of these chestnuts out of the fires was a young man called Grant, who spent most of his time out cleaning up these states. Anyway, Fourth Iowa wins the battle. I say wins. They have some help. There was one or two other outfits. Uh, down here in uh, Pea Ridge, from there they go through Arkansas. They hook up with Grant. Grant tries to take Vicksburg. Uh, but doesn't succeed the first time. The second time, he does. So now you've got Missouri out of the war, you've got the better part of Arkansas out of the war. Once they take Vicksburg, Mississippi almost ceases to, to be a real big problem. This part is pretty much Union control. We didn't have a whole lot going on in Louisiana, or at least the Fourth Island. From there, we go across Tennessee, and there was a little skirmish over here in a place called Chattanooga. Uh, where the Union Army finds itself surrounded by a Confederate army, so everybody descends on it. Well, they end up bailing out that army over here in Chattanooga, and a guy by the name of Sherman, who was one of the commanders with uh, most of the Iowa troops, ends up just taking them all the way down through there. They come back up to the two Carolinas, and the war ends right about there. So it's taken the Army of the Potomac four years to go about that 100 miles. Meanwhile, all us Casey's take care of everything else for them in the process. The third Iowa, some of which came from um, uh, Story County, does basically about the same thing 
only it ends up down and through here. After Vicksburg, they were always interested in taking uh, the last of the, the ports down here in, uh, let me help me. Mobile. Mobile, thank you. Mobile. So they're going to take Louisiana first. So the third Iowa ends up down there and ended up getting beat up pretty bad. This, those poor guys ended up getting beat up pretty bad almost every place they went. Because they also, early in the war, went to a place over here in Tennessee called Shiloh. They took Fort Donaldson, which is right about here, ran right into Shiloh and just get decimated. Started off with 1,000 guys, they ended up with about 300. Okay, and that wasn't terribly uncommon. But just these guys were just kind of sneaky. No matter where they went, they caught it. Iowa has a lot of Medal of Honor winners to boot. Okay, that's the short version of what Iowa did. Is there any questions? Yes. Where did the Seventh Iowa go? Seventh Iowa Infantry? Yes. They started off at Shiloh, up in through here. Now you're going to ask me a question. Yeah. I know they were at Shiloh, and I know they were at Fort Donaldson, at least I think they were at Fort Donaldson. Uh, they also, everybody who was at Shiloh gets, gets beat up pretty bad. But almost everybody ends up at the Atlanta campaign, and most of them end up going with Sherman, at least this far, down to Savannah. Almost everybody is also at Vicksburg. So I know they were there, I know they didn't get into Louisiana. But once, of course, now once you take territory, like up here, they have to leave a lot of people behind. So uh, some of the uh, Iowa Cavalry units, they end up spending a fair amount of time in Missouri chasing the guerrillas. The 7th Iowa, which is represented today, they're out here chasing Indians. The 6th and 7th Iowa Cavalry were out of the West. Although they were in the Civil War, they never saw a rebel. Yeah, West Virginia seceded from Virginia, who seceded from the United States. <laughs> they double dipped them. No, they just never really got along. Uh, West Virginia, before the war, uh, they had a lot of Union sentiment. There was also a lot of Union sentiment over here in eastern Tennessee. When people don't tell you, there was also a fair amount of Confederate sympathizers in Iowa. They just never got very far. But you had certain places, like in Alabama, let's put it this way, every southern state had at least one Union regiment come out of it, with the exception of North Carolina. Okay. Now, some of those were colored regiments, but nonetheless. Uh, there were two or three counties down in Mississippi, Mississippi, down in through there in Alabama, that the Confederates had to keep attacking. It was real strong Union down there. So the Confederates had to have you and station down Yes, sir. How did you do on bringing uh, the dead back? Are there still a lot of them buried in the south? Did you bring them back? Uh, if you go, yeah, if you go to any of the places we fought, Shiloh, Key Ridge, and there's a cemetery there. So what we would do is bury them, and we'd make sure we tried to make a very accurate. We won most of our battles. Unlike the boys in the east, we won most of ours. Uh, so we had time to, to give them a, at least a, a fairly decent burial. But then they would come back later, disinter them, and make a cemetery out of it. So almost every time you had a major battle, you also had a cemetery. Also, it wasn't uncommon. If you lost somebody down there, to hire one of the locals to locate the grave, and you'd bring the body home afterwards. So that happened. Yeah. I was wondering if you could say anything about the Graybeards from Iowa? Ah, the Graybeards. Iowa has several claims to fame, some of which are disputed. But the two they have, for the most part, uh, I said it's been gone for a while. <laughs> okay, here's your, here's your cheerleader. The Graybeards were the 37th Iowa, as I recall, is that right? 37. I get confused between the 30 some of Anyway, they came in, and as they're taking all this territory, it dawns on them after a while they have to hold it. You can't just take it and chunk the territory and move on because they come in behind you. So they were having to leave men there who were fit for combat. 
Well, the 37th Iowa comes along, and the oldest guy in the 37th, or yeah, 37th, does anybody know how old he was? His name was King. 82. He was the oldest Civil War soldier. The youngest guy in the 37th was uh, 53. They were, they did garrison duty, they were guards at uh, the Rock Island Arsenal. Most of them didn't last very long, okay? Those of you who are of retirement age, now pretend like you're living in a tent 24-7 and eating all the stuff I told you you were eating, okay? It was a nice thought, it just didn't necessarily work out all that well. So the, our, one of our claims to fame is we had the oldest guy who was 82, and we sent per capita more people than any other state to you. I think on that note, uh, we'll thank Mr. Fargo. And if you have more questions, come up afterwards and ask them.